Good evening and welcome New York 14. My name is Alejandra and I'm office manager at the Office of Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Thank you all for joining our town hall today. Just a few housekeeping things before we start. If you are logged into our Zoom meeting, please use the question and answer feature to submit your questions. We prioritize questions from our constituents. So please um, tell us what neighborhood you live in uh, from New York 14. Alternatively, you can also email your questions to aoc.townhall at mail.house.gov or call us at 718-662-5970. Our staff is also available to support with any technical difficulties. Our team members will be monitoring the chat and the inbox and phone. We will also be live on the Congresswoman's YouTube channel. So feel free to visit our YouTube channel and see, watch the live stream. Cart open captions is provided by All Hands in Motion. If you click the link in the chat, it will take you to a website where you can view the transcription. For today's town hall, we will hear the Congresswoman on infrastructure package and an update from the FEMA funeral program. The Congresswoman will also be joined by IRS Congressional District Liaison, Susan Gaines, um, who will share an update on the child tax credit. We will open it up for Q&A from constituents after. After the Q&A, there will be a press gaggle where members of the press can post any questions. And now I'd like to invite the representative from New York's 14th Congressional District, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Wonderful, thank you so much, Alejandra, for, for kind of emceeing our town hall today. and. Uh, for everyone who may not know of our constituents here in New York 14, Alejandro is one of the newer members on our team, and we're really thrilled uh, to be having her. So thank you again so much, Alejandra, for kicking us off. Uh, we have quite the agenda today of things to get through, so um, we're just going to dive right in. We're going to be talking, I just... As you can see with the slide on the main screen, we are going to be discussing the FEMA funeral program. We're also going to be talking about uh, the CTC, the child tax credits that are hitting, hopefully, almost everyone's bank accounts uh, today, certainly if you have direct deposits set up. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, more of the administration. We have a wonderful, we have Susan, a uh, wonderful, uh, you know, just you know, multi, uh, I, I'm not trying to out uh, her her tenure, but um, as we were joking earlier before, but uh, let's just say Susan is probably one of the most qualified and, um, and experienced uh, folks at the IRS that, that we could possibly have joining us here today uh, to really give everyone the lowdown on the child tax credit and to help you potentially help others access uh, the child tax credit as well. So uh, we're really excited about that we're going to dive in. Um, and so we're going to do that at the top, though, uh, there are some things that we want to make sure uh, that we address, we're going to address the FEMA funeral program, as well as uh, certain current events, including uh, latest update on the infrastructure bill and negotiations, what's going on between the Senate and the House and the White House. And additionally, um, and I'll start here. We also want to respond to some of the current events in Cuba as well. We have, uh, just as we have in our district, in our community, we represent, and I'm privileged to represent, uh, one of the most diverse communities in the world. And that includes our wonderful and our beautiful uh, Cuban community right here in New York 14. You know, one of the things that's extraordinarily important and that we have seen is the, uh, the rise of everyday people in the island of Cuba and Cubans, just everyday working class Cubans and Cubans all across the island, standing up for their rights and standing up for um, to protest the intolerable conditions that have been happening on the island. Uh, this includes everything from the desperate lack of medical supplies and other key uh, whether it's medical supplies, food, or other key materials or utilities uh, throughout the island, particularly exacerbated uh, during the pandemic, excuse me, sorry, um, uh, sorry, uh, during the pandemic. Um, I apologize. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so 
they are protesting the lack of materials uh, during the pandemic, particularly the lack of medical supplies and other issues. And so one of the things that we're trying to accomplish and one of the things that we want to make sure that we communicate is our solidarity with the Cuban people. They have requested international solidarity with their movement and we stand in strong solidarity. And one of the things that's important for us to discuss is some of the contributing factors into this situation. One thing that we must uh, unequivocally condemn are anti-democratic actions, anti-democratic actions uh, on behalf of the Diaz-Canel uh, administration. And we wanna make extremely clear that suppression of the freedom of press and uh, the suppression of protest and the suppression of, free, of freedom of speech is unacceptable and runs contrary to our democratic values. And we call on uh, the Diaz-Canel administration to, to, uh, to, treat its, to treat all protesters and to condemn any uh, police violence and to reverse all, any and all policies of that. Now, the other piece of this is the US administration. And what's extraordinarily important for us to communicate as well is, you, is, the, is the actions and US contributions to the suffering of Cubans on the island as well. And that is directly related to the embargo, the US embargo, uh, economic embargo, that is, uh, that is frankly, uh, has been in place for over 60 years. Last month, uh, once again, the, uh, the UN voted overwhelmingly uh, to call on the United States to lift its embargo on Cuba. And the United States was one of the only uh, countries that voted no. The embargo, the U.S. embargo, is absurdly cruel. And like other U.S. policies, particularly other U.S. policies targeting Latin Americans and Latinos, the cruelty is the point. And I outright reject the Biden administration's defense of the embargo, where they say, or they have said that they wanted to maintain the, bar the embargo as it is a source of leverage and pressure, there is no way where it is acceptable for us to use cruelty as a, as a point of leverage against everyday people, period. Whether it's our border or whether it's the U.S. embargo on, on Cuba, the cruelty is the point. And I want to make something very clear as well. The embargo has been escalating very recently. We had a point during the Obama administration where tensions between the US and Cuba were starting to thaw and we were actually making progress in the relationship between the United States and Cuba in uh, dismantling some of the pieces of the embargo, at least those actions that were uh, accessible via the executive branch. Now, what happened during the Trump administration is that when the Trump administration came in, uh, Trump not only reversed those, those steps of progress that Obama made, but he, he essentially took us a few steps backwards in reversing those steps. But then he also declared Cuba a terrorist state. And in doing so, it added another, an additional 200 or so um, measures to the embargo, which included making it difficult for med more difficult for medical supplies to reach the island, as well as many other critical, um, critical supplies. Now, when the, when the Biden administration came in, I wish I could Biden administration uh, was restoring the progress made under the Obama administration. But frankly, it just seems that they are committing to Donald Trump's trajectory towards Cuba. And I find that I find it unacceptable. We have not seen the reversal in the additional restrictive measures uh, placed on placed by Donald Trump. The Biden administration has not reversed those measures. And very critically, during the Obama administration, as one of the steps of progress that the Obama administration made was that 
the United States started to abstain from the UN vote, uh, from the UN vote condemning the embargo. That was an extremely important step because the president and the presidency cannot reverse the embargo completely by themselves. That does take an act of Congress. And we support lifting the embargo against Cuba. Now, what the Biden administration decided to do, and this is where there is a direct escalation in aggressiveness towards Cuba by a Democratic administration, where the Biden administration stopped the Obama era practice of abstaining from that vote. And they have now become the first, the first Democratic administration since the Obama administration, um, which yes, we went Obama, Trump, then Biden, um, to then go back and no longer abstain from that vote, but to actively defy the entire global, virtually the, the vast majority of the global community in saying, no, we refuse to uh, roll back this cruel and inhumane embargo that is promoting the suffering of the Cuban people. And so in this, uh, our, message, our message is extraordinarily clear is that we condemn the actions, the, 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 uh, the actions of suppressing freedom of the press and the anti-democratic actions of, um, of, of targeting protesters, violence against uprisings under the Diaz-Canel uh, uh, Diaz uh, regime, but we end rather, and we also condemn the Biden administration's uh, decision to continue to contribute to the suffering of working people across Cuba and the prevention and the, and the um, upholding of uh, elements of the embargo as well as Trump era, uh, the additional Trump era restrictions that are making it harder for working people and everyday people across the island to access medical supplies as well as other basic, basic um, other basic, uh, materials and supplies. And I, I think it's important for us to call out and to really acknowledge hypocrisy where it is. When the Trump administration added these additional restrictions, they were condemned. They were condemned by Democrats and they were condemned by foreign policy experts. It was, they, the message was extraordinarily clear during that time. And it was wrong when Trump did it and it's wrong when Biden is doing it. And it's important for us to be able to say that um, and to be able to acknowledge when the Biden administration is doing something wrong while also not allowing uh, the, the targeting of protesters to be put off the hook by, uh, by the, the government in Cuba as well. So that is a, our first piece of current events. I'm gonna dive into an update on the FEMA program then we're going to go back to current events on the infrastructure bill, and then we're going to kick it over uh, to the child tax credit summary. So quick update on the FEMA funeral program. Um, many of you all have, many of us here on the island, I mean on the island, in the state, uh, many of us here in the state and across the country uh, have been able to benefit an extraordinary, an extraordinary amount from the FEMA funeral assistance program that um, was led by myself and uh, and Senator Schumer um, in the American Rescue Plan, as well as uh, us working to get it actually a little bit in some legislation last year. So as a quick update, uh, one of the things that we've been having to tackle is the fact that our community was one of the first communities hit during the pandemic. And as such, when people were starting to get admitted to places like Elmhurst Hospital and Jacoby, uh, presenting signs of what we now know as COVID. Back then, we couldn't, we didn't quite know that it was COVID yet. And so because the funeral assistance program requires COVID to be uh, cited on a death certificate in order to have your funeral costs reimbursed, we've been trying to chip away and make sure that there's a little bit of flexibility for, uh, for those families that were affected at the beginning of the pandemic when, um, when COVID was not a, a standard practice of citation uh, in, in death certificates and uh, ad, you know, in, in records. So uh, in our update, four deaths from January 20th to May 16th of last year 
any death certificate that does not list COVID does not have to be formally changed. You can now send in uh, a signed letter. The letter must come uh, from the, either the person who certified the death certificate or the local med medical examiner or coroner. So if you are having trouble accessing the FEMA funeral assistance program because you have lost you lost a loved one to COVID in the early days of the pandemic between January and May. You can just call three one one, and they will connect you um, to. They can help connect you to an individual that will get you the signed letter that FEMA needs uh, in order for you to access those funds. The statement must be on official letterhead. It must identify COVID-19 as a cause or contributing cause of death, and it must include information linking it to the original death certificate. So that's the update for you. We were successful in being able to add some of that flexibility so you don't have to go through jumping all of those hoops in a formal change of the death certificate, which can be a much more difficult uh, process to go through. So that's our latest update there. Um, now, and now let's just dive in quickly to the infrastructure deal. Now, um, here's the latest update on where things are. You see this big chart? Don't worry about it right now. Uh, what, we, what I want to start off by framing is basically here's the current state of play with our infrastructure negotiations. Uh, the Senate announced just yesterday uh, um, that they that they have come to an agreement, the Senate side has come to an agreement in authorizing somewhere in about $3.5 trillion uh, in a package um, in about eight to 10 years uh, for infrastructure investment. So they are going to authorize a three about a $3.5 trillion package. That is what was uh, announced yesterday on the Senate side. Um, and then in terms of and then the House side, uh, we are ready to go on something that's known as reconciliation, which I'll move later. In addition to that broader infrastructure bill, we have this bipartisan infrastructure proposal. And this bipartisan infrastructure proposal is, oops, sorry about that. <laughs> Deco is, uh, Deco's upset by the bipartisan bill. <laughs> Um, the bipartisan infrastructure proposal is much smaller and, uh, and it does not meet the same needs that the overall proposal for and what the and frankly what the Biden administration has outlined is necessary. And so um, so that is kind of the rub, right? We have the bipartisan uh, bill and then we have the overall infrastructure bill where the Senate and the House have to, kind of come to an agreement. Now, here's the problem with the bipartisan bill. As you can see, and if you could you go if you could go back uh, one slide, as you can see, uh, this blue bar is what the Biden administration's proposal is on the infrastructure plan. Now, for the record, when the Biden administration released their plan, it was already <laughs> too small, in my opinion, for us to meet our infrastructure needs. But no matter, the blue bar is the Biden, uh, is the Biden American jobs plan. That is his infrastructure uh, outline, right? And as you can see, the kind of pinkish salmon color um, bars are the bipartisan infrastructure uh, deal. Now, this is not all of the spending. This is just some of the categories where you see the bipartisan infrastructure deal does meet some of the full requests, but also falls very far, far short in things like uh, electric vehicles, for example. And what's really important when I talk about why the Biden administration's infrastructure plan was already too small, an example here is in passenger and freight rail. A lot of those investments are on kind of sprucing up, uh, sprucing up Amtrak and sprucing up, um, sprucing up rail that already exists that has been underinvested. But the Biden administration um, and in these numbers are not allocations for things like new high-speed rail, which is what an infrastructure bill 
should actually uh, really truly contain. And that's one of the things that we're pushing on the house side, right? Because one of the beauties in our system of checks and balances is that everybody has their contribution. And so the Biden proposal is nice. It's it, There are going to be places where we push and have been able to push um, the Biden administration, where we're going to actually get things and fund things that the Biden administration uh, did not have in their proposal. There are going to be areas where, as you can see with this bipartisan deal, where it may get less investment than necessary. Um, and so one of the things that we want to make very clear is that we are not letting go of certain key areas, which is not on this graph, of, um, of care infrastructure. Things like child care, things like health care, and things like, um, I mean, frankly, just an enormous amount of uh, the social service um, infrastructure sector. And so we can go to our next slide now. And so one of the priorities, uh, as I mentioned, excluded from the bipartisan deal is that the bipartisan deal has nothing on housing. It has nothing on long-term care. It has nothing on tax credits like clean and renewable energy. Uh, if, you know, if you own a home or have a building or a vehicle, uh, we used to have very aggressive tax credits uh, for you to get an electric car or install solar panels. And um, even now, hoping to expand not just for car infrastructure, but for things like um, other forms of, of electric transport, uh, which those tax credits are very critical because they help people afford transitioning their transportation, transitioning their home to clean and renewable energy. And lastly, the bipartisan deal has nothing in research and development and manufacturing of new clean tech. Um, funding in this bipartisan deal, uh, it includes some things that were not in the Biden proposal, uh, a financing authority and Superfund rem remediation, but they're pretty modest. Um, so what does that mean for us, right? This doesn't look super rosy. So what does that mean that we're gonna do? So we can go to our next slide. What this means is that we've got the bipartisan deal, which is way too small. And by the way, we do not need a bipartisan deal in order to pass this bill. I think it's great that Republicans are, you know, wanting to join some Democrats. That's wonderful, but they, but, but this country and people across the country elected democratic majorities. They elected a democratic president, they elected a democratic house majority, and they elected a democratic Senate. And so what that means is that Republicans are not in charge of dictating what policies we pass and what policies we don't pass. And the idea that we would be limited by a bipartisan deal is laughable. It is laughable. And I think especially as time has gone on, we've also seen that the fossil fuel industry um, has been revealed to be playing a very critical role in trying to push this bipartisan deal. Uh, there was um, there was Exxon Mobil lobbyists that were kind of caught on tape admitting that they have been uh, ha essentially having Democratic and Republican senators um, essentially on speed dial and talking to them weekly as they try to contour the shapes of the bipartisan deal. And we are starting to see some of that echoed in public statements. You know, you have um, Exxon Mobil saying, we have someone like Joe Manchin on speed dial and we talk to him every week and Exxon Mobil lobbyists are huddling with, uh, they named 11 senators, Democratic and Republican that they huddle with. Um, and then we're now like a week or two later uh, hearing some of those same folks saying, we need to protect the fossil fuel industry um, they're very deeply concerned with, with the investments that we're making in clean energy and helping people transition their energy needs. I mean, this is ridiculous. 
This is straight up the kind of legal corruption and money in politics that is really eroding our ability to save our planet, give ourselves health care, establish a public health care system, and, um, and really invest in our infrastructure. And so that is just one of many reasons why we will not only accept a bipartisan bill and investment alone. Uh, we are we are going to say great, you know, if if we if there are some Republicans who are willing to, you know, sign on to and want to invest in things like rail infrastructure and roads and bridges. Fine, that's great. We can break off those pieces that Republicans are going to agree with and we can figure out what we can pass on a bipartisan basis. But there are also investments that we need that are not included in the bipartisan deal, as I've mentioned earlier. And we cannot allow that bipartisan deal to stop critical investments that we need to pass and invest right now. And so how we're gonna do this other thing, how we're gonna pass the big infrastructure bill is a process known as reconciliation. Um, now, what does this mean? Uh, reconciliation is one of the only ways that the Senate can actually pass legislation in the modern era due to the filibuster. And so because the filibuster has essentially created a 60 vote uh, requirement in the Senate to pass any sort of meaningful legislation, the only way that you can pass anything, you know, the only way you can pass almost anything else is through a process known as reconciliation. Budget reconciliation can be passed with 51 votes. That is how, for example, that big Republican tax scam that got passed in 2017, where, you know, where they, um, where we had all those changes in SALT and you had all of these other sorts of changes in charitable giving, et cetera. Um, that was passed with 51 Republican votes, or rather with, uh, not with 51 Republican votes, but uh, it was passed, it was it, it bypassed a filibuster requiring less than 60 votes uh, because Republicans used reconciliation. And so Republicans, they use reconciliation to cut taxes on the wealthy, to give themselves tax cuts on their yachts and private jets and Wall Street loopholes and whatnot. And what Democrats are gonna use reconciliation for is infrastructure investment that's going to expand childcare um, and that's going to expand Medicare, that's going to create a civilian climate core, which was uh, you know, our, central, our central provision, which I'm really excited about and we can dive into. Um, but we're going to use our opportunity at reconciliation because you can't just pass anything through reconciliation. It has to be budget related. So it needs to be government spending related. Uh, and you can only use reconciliation twice a year. So those stimulus checks that you got um, and the child tax credit that we're getting, that's starting to hit your bank accounts now, that was all in, and the FEMA funeral assistance program, that was all in the American Rescue Plan that we passed earlier this year. That was also a reconciliation bill. So we get about two shots to uh, work to pass a reconciliation bill per year. So our first shot was the American Rescue Plan with the stimulus checks and pandemic assistance, uh, funding for schools and hospitals, et cetera. And now our second reconciliation bill for this year is going to be this infrastructure bill. So our reconciliation, uh, you know, these are the rules that allows the, the 51 uh, vote majority. And so what are we going to include in our larger infrastructure reconciliation bill? Universal pre-K across the country for three and four year olds. So a little bit of what we had created here in New York City with universal 3K and how that was like slowly rolled out. We're gonna try to make that national right here in this reconciliation bill. I'm really, really, really excited about it. The next is childcare subsidies, because as we know, childcare is as much or sometimes more than rent. And it is obscene. You know, it's so funny. There's like, 
all of these stories about how there's a, you know, that about how there's a labor shortage and how there aren't enough people to fill jobs. Well, it's because childcare is so expensive that putting your kid and paying for your kid's childcare for you to turn around and make an hourly wage uh, is more, it's more expensive for you to go to work and put your kid in childcare than it is for you to stay home and take care of your child. And so, um, you know, if we want people to have choice in their life and to have the ability to make the decisions that they want to make, uh, we need to make sure that childcare is started to be treated as a right in the United States. And childcare subsidies is one of the key steps that we are making um, to hopefully be able to, to one day pave the path and to make sure we pave, start paving the path to universal childcare uh, in the United States. But we're not there yet, so we're starting at childcare subsidies. We've got paid family and medical leave, which is you know, key, it's crucial. Uh, expanded investment in truly affordable housing, um, expanding Medicare. So this reconciliation bill will expand Medicare so that it can cover dental, vision, and hearing for our seniors. No need to buy any of these crazy, um, you know, additional plans or pay out of pocket or any of that. We're going to expand Medicare so that your hearing devices, glasses, dental care will be covered. We're also gonna increase the maximum Pell Grant to help with the cost of college. And we're going to implement the clean green energy standard to ensure clean energy by 2030. A Green New Deal, uh, uh, which is a Green New Deal PEG year. We are also, speaking of the Green New Deal, we are also going to, it looks like we have secured a key provision in the Green New Deal in this infrastructure plan, which is the Civilian Climate Corps. I'm so excited about this. Um, for those of you who may not know, during um, the Great Depression or in the aftermath of the Great Depression and the New Deal era, Franklin Delano Roosevelt created the Civilian Conservation Corps. And if you have visited a national park in your life <clears throat> or a state park, many of the trails that you see were built in that 1938 to 1941, 42, a conservation Corps era program by, civilian, uh, by those who enlisted in the Civilian Conservation Corps. Now, what we've decided to do in a big part of uh, our G&D proposals was a restoration of this Roosevelt era program, but expanded to tackle the climate crisis. Now, the reason this is really important was because when FDR did this, the United States, uh, when FDR, after FDR launched the Civilian Conservation Corps, the US then had, as a result of the Corps, one of the best wildfire control records in its history at that time or by that time. And so the Civilian Climate Corps recognizes the incredibly large need for environmental work um, in our country to protect our communities, invest in our communities, and beautify our communities as we prepare for the ravages of climate change. And so the Civilian Climate Corps funding, it will dramatically expand the AmeriCorps fund. Uh, it will dramatically expand the AmeriCorps program in the United States. We're starting to get um, some numbers. Uh, so I don't want to say if we're going to be doubling, tripling, increasing by 50, 75%. Once that number, once we kind of uh, solidify that number, I'll let you know. But it's a really exciting investment. It is the first time that the core will be uh, really brought back since, since, you know, it's the first time it'll be really created since 1938. Um, and it's extraordinarily exciting. We've also got EV incentives, immig immigration reform. We are including a path to citizenship uh, for millions of people in this reconciliation bill. And so we're hoping that, the, that this uh, survives the parliamentarian um, as well as extending the child tax credit that we've got today. So that is the reconciliation bill. And then we can go to our next slide. 
So how do we get it done, right? You've got the bipartisan piece, we have the reconciliation piece. This is what, it, this is what we're doing. House progressives are standing up House progressives, I just want to, I just want to let y'all know <laughs> where this is coming from. Um, we only have a four vote margin in the House. And so myself, as well as, um, as other progressive members in the House, Congresswoman uh, Pramila Jayapal, Ayanna Presley, Rashida Tlaib, et cetera, as well as many other members of a progressive caucus, Barbara Lee, um, we have made the stand and we said, we will tank the bipartisan infrastructure bill unless we get also pass the reconciliation bill. And so it goes both ways, right? If Manchin and in the Senate, if they approve our reconciliation bill, we will approve their bipartisan bill. And if they try to strip immigration uh, reform, if they try to you know, try to claw back on childcare, climate action, et cetera, then, then we're, at, we're at an impasse, it's a no-go. And so because both of these parties really want to pass their, their own legislation, we do find so far that the strategy has been enormously uh, successful. When this bipartisan plan was coming together, it was trying to be used as a mechanism to tank our reconciliation bill. And so what we've said is your bipartisan bill is not going to go anywhere because we've got the House margin. And so that's created the path for us to be able to pass both. And that's our update on infrastructure. Um, and so lastly, I'm really, really excited uh, for, our, for our next guest. We have uh, to talk about the, the 2021 child tax credit. Y'all, if you haven't checked your bank account today, if you have a kid under the age of 18 um, and you got direct deposit for your stimulus check, you might want to check your bank account today because there will likely be several hundred dollars in it that was not there yesterday. And so we've got Susan uh, Gaines here with us uh, at the from the IRS to kind of talk through the child tax credit and how you can access it if it hasn't hit your account yet as well. So Susan, take it away. I apologize, I always technology issues. So I hope you all can hear me okay. Um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to share this important information. Everything that I'm going to be sharing with you all today can be found on irs.gov forward slash child tax credit 2021. And I will share that link at the end of the presentation just to make sure that you have it. Now, part of, the, yeah, thank you. Part of the American Rescue Plan expanded the previous child tax credit for tax year 2021 only. The expanded child tax credit will allow families to receive up to $3,000 for each qualifying child age six to 17 and up to $3,600 for each qualifying child age zero to five. And that child's age is based on their age as of December 31st, 2021. So at the end of this year, that's what we base their age on. Now, in previous years, such as 2020, the child tax credit was limited to the amount of $2,000 per qualifying child. And that was only for children under age 17. So for 2020 only, right now, the American Rescue Plan increased that credit amount by $1,000 for any child six to 17 and $1,600 per qualifying child under the age of six. Next slide, please. Advanced payments of the 2021 child tax credit will be made monthly starting today and going through December to eligible tax filers who have a main home in the United States for more than half the year. Now, the total amount of these advanced payments will be up to 50% of the estimated total child tax credit for tax year 2021. This means that for qualifying child, children aged zero to five, you, you may receive an advanced monthly payment of up to $1,800, or totaling $1,800 or $300 a month. And for children six to 17, your advanced payments will total up to $1,500 or $250 a month. 
Now you will need to file a 2021 tax return in order to reconcile your advanced child tax credit payments and more importantly, to get the other half of the credit. You're only receiving half of this credit in advance. Now the advance payments are going to be based on the information the IRS has on file for you. So that first we'll look at your 2020 tax return. And if that's not already processed, we'll look to your 2019 tax return. And if we do not have either tax return on file, we will also look toward what you input into the non-filers tool last year. A lot of people use that non-filers tool to sign up for their stimulus or economic impact payments last year. So we'll use that. But if we don't have any of that, I'll tell you in just a few minutes how you can give us more information. Now the amount of your estimated advance payments will be determined based on your household factors such as adjusted gross income, the number of qualifying children, and your filing status. And I'll talk in just a minute how you can provide the IRS with additional information on how to update those things. So now I'm going to briefly discuss the eligibility requirements. So next slide, please. Yes. The tax return filer, the person filing the tax return, must be eligible to claim the 2021 child tax credit and the child or children must also be qualifying children. The tax filer's eligibility is based on having a home in the United States for more than half the year. There are a couple exceptions like for active duty military, if you're on active duty for 90 days or more or for an indefinite period of time, you're considered to be living in the United States during that time. Also, the person filing the tax return must have a social security number or an I-10, an individual tax ID number. And your income has to be below certain amounts. And there's several factors to determine if someone is a qualifying child for you. Namely, they have to be under 18 and you need to be able to claim them as a dependent. And next slide, please. So there's three tools available on the IRS website to help you with your child tax credit payments. First, the child tax credit eligibility assistant. So you can use the eligibility assistant to to find out if you're eligible for the child tax credit. Now this tool is an important step, especially if you don't normally file a tax return. You answer a few questions about yourselves and your family members, and then you can quickly determine whether or not you qualify for the credit. Like I said, anybody can use this tool, but it's particularly helpful for those that don't normally file a tax return. Now the next tool I wanna to mention today is the newly revised non-filer tool. And this is on the next slide. People who do not file a tax return for 2019 or 2020 and did not use that non-filers tool to sign up for their economic impact payments or stimulus payments can use this new non-filer sign-up tool to give the IRS the information we need in order to help you get your payments. This tool will enable you to provide information about yourself, and your qualifying children 17 or under, and actually any other dependents you may have, and provide the IRS with your bank account information for direct deposit to help you get those payments as soon as possible. This tool is actually also available for anyone that did not receive their stimulus payments. So maybe you're just now hearing about the economic impact payments. You can use this tool to register to receive your uh, the third economic impact payment, that $1,400 per individual. And if you didn't get the, the two stimulus payments the year before, you can claim them as the 2020 recovery rebate credit. So anybody that's not already signed up should use this tool to sign up to get the credits that you're eligible for. And then the third tool I wanna talk to you about tonight is the child tax credit update portal on the next slide. This tool will allow families to verify their eligibility for the payments and if they choose to, unenroll for these monthly payments. Some people may wanna wait and get their full amount of their child tax credit next year when they file their tax return. Or maybe they had children on their 2019 and 2020 tax return, but for whatever reason, they don't have those children with them anymore. So they might wanna unenroll to prevent getting those payments. Remember I said you were going to have to reconcile these on a 2021 tax return. 
And currently this tool can also be used to provide banking information to the IRS. So if we don't have your correct bank account, maybe you changed banks or you closed your account since the time you filed your tax return, you can use the tool today to provide the IRS updated banking information so we can get your August payment to you rather than by mail, but by direct deposit. Now this tool is password protected, it's very secure, and it allows any eligible individual with internet, internet access and a smartphone or computer to access it. And then coming later this summer, on the next slide, we have a few more updates that you'll be able to make on the portal. You'll be able to use the portal to change your address, to report a change in your income. Maybe your income was higher in 2019 or 2020 and you didn't qualify for the advance payments based on your income, but for 2021 it's lower. So you'll be able to report that to the IRS and get caught up with your advance payments. Or maybe your marital status has changed or you've had a change to the number of qualifying children, such as a child that was born in 2021 or you're a parent that swaps claiming the child as a dependent each year with the child's other parent. So you'll be able to update that information with the IRS. Also, if last month or, or recently you decided to unenroll from the payments and you decide, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that, you'll be able to use the tool to re-enroll. Now with that, I, I wanted to keep this short because I wanna get to your questions. I think that's most important. So all three tools that I've talked about are available on irs.gov forward slash child tax credit 2021. That's the link in the top of the blue box on the right side of your screen. And when you go to that page, you'll see what's on the left there, all three tools that are available on the website. In addition, there's frequently asked questions and lots of resources that you can share with other people that may not be aware of the credit. So thank you so much again for your for the opportunity to share this information and I'll let you have it Alejandra to let us know what kind of questions we have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your remarks, Susan. Um, so we will now move on to the Q&A portion of the town hall. Um, as mentioned earlier, constituents sign into via Zoom. You may use the Q&A feature to submit your questions. Um, please mention what neighborhood and city you're from as we prioritize questions from constituents. Also a reminder for the press and um, that we will have a press gaggle where you can post any questions after um, our constituents. So now um, the first question from Laureen from Jackson Heights ask regarding the infrastructure bill, and this is for the Congresswoman. Um, how can we keep the, this infusion of capital in education past this package? So thank you so much, Lorene, for uh, your question. And I think that uh, one of the things that's really important for us to communicate, and I think one of the things that would be really helpful for us to for everyday people to speak up about is that this infrastructure package really just represents a down payment on the larger infrastructure needs of this country. There's a lot of really great, historic, uh, wonderful things in this package, whether it is the uh, reestablishment and the establishment of a civilian climate core and uh, dramatically expanding the AmeriCorps program, whether it's universal uh, 3K and pre-K, uh, all of this is, is really historic and incredible uh, expansion, you know, expansion of, um, of Medicare to include dental and, and vision. These are really important investments, but they are just a, a, a drop in the bucket in a way in terms of the additional infrastructure investment that we're going to need. We need to lower the age of Medicare. I mean, like, I believe that it should be lowered to zero, but at minimum, we should be bringing that from um, 65 to 60, as Biden had indicated, um, and you know, even in 2016, uh, the 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 main Democratic uh, nominee with Secretary Clinton was talking about Medicare lowering the age of Medicare to 55 or 50, and so that range is really what we need as soon as possible. 
as well as, you know, I think, frankly, opening up Medicare uh, so all people can enjoy it and no one has to worry about having to pay for an enormous deductible or huge prescription prices or anything like that. And so, uh, so what's really important on the, on the note of education is to keep pushing and saying, listen, this is just a down payment in terms of the infrastructure needs that are going to be necessary. And in fact, I believe today, um, Congressman Bowman, right, who's our uh, congressional neighbor, is actually releasing the Green New Deal for schools. And, um, and we're really excited about that because it not only is talking about the 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 you know making sure that we are retrofitting and rebuilding our schools to clean energy standards and uh, making sure that they are efficient uh, in terms of the bricks but also it brings in that sustainability so that we have expanded um employ we have expanded protections and actually gets into the actual social infrastructure and curriculum in schools with teachers um, students etc and so we have to keep pushing which you know we're i'm currently i mean spoiler alert i'm working on a green new deal for uh transportation and we will be introducing that um, you know, at some point, likely after the passage of this infrastructure bill, because this bill is the down payment, and we need to make sure that we continue pushing on the investments that we need. So, um, so we're not forgetting it. There are critical investments here that are going to help um, help communities and help families, but we do need to keep pushing on the front of education. Awesome, thank you, Congresswoman. The next question will be for Susan. And this is from one of our constituents, Louise. What forms should the taxpayer file for the to get the child tax credit? Hi, Louise. Thanks. That's a great question. Now you can use the non-filer tool, or if you're required to file a tax return, you would file a form 1040. The 1040 provides enough information about you and your family to sign you up for the child tax credit and the advance payments of. So you'll use a 2020 form 1040 name, address, social security numbers or items for the people filing the tax return and the children's information on that return. Susan, I think you're muted. I think you muted briefly. Oh, was that the whole time or? <laughs> no, no, it just cut out like, you know, five seconds ago. Okay, thank you. So yes, just submit that to the Internal Revenue Service and we can get you the address, go through the Congresswoman's office, we'll get you the address on where to send that, but that's the form you need. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, our next question will be for Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez. Um, Callie from Astoria asks, how can I combine, convince my friends to get the vaccine? I am 22 and got mine months ago, uh, but many of my friends who are my age refuse to get the vaccine because they're young and healthy. Some are afraid of the side effects of the vaccine. Um, do you have any advice for me on how to persuade them to get the vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so, so much, Kali, for your question. And it is a really important question because you know, we know that the most persuasive person in a person's life is someone that they have a close relationship to that they already trust. And so you talking to your friends about it is uh, you're already, you know, in the right place and asking the right questions because you can get through to your friends in a way that you know, a lot of other people, including myself, um, potentially would have a harder time with. So how you can, you know, have conversations encouraging your friends to get the vaccine. I think number one, a really good rule is don't be judgmental. You know, don't nag them, don't, um, don't tell them, don't make them feel bad about it or anything like that, because that can sometimes sour the interaction in a way that now, whatever you tell them, even if it's like, can you pick me up some chips on the way home? They're going to be like, no. <laughs> so create a positive environment in that conversation. That I'd say is rule number one. Now, number two, I think is to really be armed with some information, particularly about the Delta variant. And I'm going to help you with some of that information today. So right now in the United States, 
the vast majority of COVID vaccinations or, a, or rather a huge amount of COVID vaccinations are due to the Delta variant. And out of all of the hospitalizations in, uh, in the United States, about 99.2% of all people hospitalized in COVID, due to COVID in the US are unvaccinated. Now, why does this matter? Your friends are young and healthy today. That is amazing and that's awesome. However, the Delta variant is shown to be more aggressive in infecting younger patients than, than the COVID variant that we saw a year ago. Not only that, but the transmission is much lower. So the COVID that we saw last year, the one that we saw just you know, that our community's really traumatized by um, and just really just, you know, just had so much damage in our community. The transmission time for that, the, that the CDC measures was up to 15 minutes when you were within six feet of another person. Think about how much damage that COVID did, how many people got sick, with 15 minutes of exposure. The Delta variant only needs five to eight seconds of exposure. So now it's not just, you know, a lot of our interactions, especially in a city, are very passing. And uh, there are lots of people that you don't spend 15 minutes. You know, you may pass by someone with, you may have passed by someone with COVID last year, but because you were in passing and you didn't have 15 minutes in kind of an enclosed space with them, you didn't get infected. Now you just need five to eight seconds. That's a bus stop. That's getting on the bus. That is getting on the train, taking a subway, one stop and getting off, you can get infected. And so because of, so not only are younger people more at risk with the Delta variant, but because the Delta variant is more aggressive and it has much higher rates of infection with younger people, you are more likely to get COVID with the Delta variant as a younger person than you were with the original. And so now, right now is the most dangerous time that young people have experienced um, with respect to COVID. Not even last year, it's more dangerous to be a young person, an unvaccinated young person now than it was a year ago. Um, so that's one piece, you know, come arm with the facts. And there's the other piece, which is, this is not just for your friend. Um, the fact of the matter is, you know, if I'm coming in or a person may say, I'm young, I'm healthy, or even if I get COVID, I'm going to survive it, it's going to be okay. Well, just like with uh, last year, the thing is, is that you can transmit it as well. And there are older people in your life um, that all of us probably, you know, that all of us like love and care for, whether it's your neighbor, whether it's your grandparent or your parent, that will be put in danger if you are going around unvaccinated and potentially transmitting the disease. So one of the other things we know about the Delta variant is that it, it, if you are vaccinated, it is still possible to get, uh, to get, uh, to get COVID and infected by the Delta variant. Now, what's the difference? The difference is that the vaccine prevents death. So the vaccine will keep a person from passing away from COVID, but that should not be the measure. COVID has, has created long-term, and we don't even know, in some cases, we don't know if it's long-term or permanent damage in the way that some people have. There are people that report after getting COVID, you know, they didn't pass away, but they can no longer walk five or six blocks. In fact, we have someone uh, that, that we know um, connected to, to our team that got a case of COVID and, um, and has difficulty while she was vaccinated, has difficulty speaking. I mean, rather has difficulty, you know, walking a few blocks. And so my, my tip number one is stay positive. Tip number two, come with information and particularly talk about Delta. 
And tip number three is to make it not just about them, but to make it about protecting the people that they love. And so those are my three. And um, know that it takes multiple conversations. And, you know, you're not alone. I have... I know people in my life that were um, that were reluctant to get the vaccine, and that's the that's the method that I took. And also know that it takes multiple conversations. And when someone knows that you have information and you're not going to be judgmental about it, they will feel more comfortable coming to you with follow up questions. And you know, I've talked to people. I've talked to people in my building and my neighbors, and it took. You know, for some folks, it took like three to five conversations, but then eventually they got there and they got vaccinated. And that is what the most important part of this all is. Thank you, Congresswoman. And our last question will go to Susan. This is from Anthony and, and they say, my cousin has a son and has already filed her taxes. How does she collect the child tax credit? As long as she's eligible, that's, I mean, that should come automatically as long as she's already filed her tax return. Everything that she needed to do has been done to, to receive those payments. So you can use that child tax credit update portal on irs.gov and check the status of your payments. The information is available on that portal right now. Good question. And Susan, someone can use that portal if they had a baby after filing their taxes, right? It's not ready yet, but later this summer, they will be able to add that information on the portal. Yes, good question Thank as well. You. Awesome. And we actually have a couple more minutes for questions, so I'll go with another one. Um, this one will be for the Congresswoman. And um, this is from Ruby from Parkchester. Um, does this infrastructure bill include opening MTA train stations in Hunts Point, Parkchester and Co-op City in the Bronx? Um, MTA. So, oh, okay. So the infrastructure bill, let's talk about the infrastructure bill with respect to the MTA, uh, train station. So in a separate and, and previous, um, term, there was, uh, there was investment, uh, that was already put in for opening MTA stations in Hunts Point, Park Chester, uh, Morris Park, et cetera. And um, in fact, there are public hearings that are going on right now that uh, between the MTA, Amtrak, et cetera, on what on the, the opening of these stations and construction in our communities. And so, the answer to your question technically is no, but the reason no is because it already was authorized. The funds are already, and the, and the project um, is already kind of on its way in, in launching the part in, in starting. Um, however, one of the things that I'm pushing for is additional high-speed rail, not just in New York, but across the country. And we've successfully been able to increase the rail expenditures on the house side by 20%. And we're hoping to really bring that up um, much to a much larger number so that we can, so that high-speed rail and rail in general isn't just a New York thing, isn't just a Northeast thing, but it's something that people across the country can enjoy. So, um, so if you are curious, about some of these um, kind of public hearings on the Hunts Point MTA station, potentially Park Chester, Morris Park stations. There are public hearings that, um, that are starting to happen right now and our office can help share that public hearing schedule. And maybe we can put it in the newsletter as well so that you can get an email with it. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, we have another question about the infrastructure bill. This is from Joshua. How can the package be funded without restoring the past tax brackets from the 1%? The tax breaks, as usual, didn't create jobs. They never do. They use tax breaks to buy back company stocks. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that um, this is, I think, one of the areas that right now the House and the Senate are going to be, you know, kind of butting heads a little bit as we try to fit these two pieces together. Um, because one of the things that, you know, frankly, we're seeing some pressure on the Senate side where our original proposal uh, was frankly, you know, to give the IRS a lot more money so that we can step up on enforcement um, so that the people, you know, making 
at the very, very, very top, making tons and tons of money, um, can get audited. <laughs> and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of revenue that comes in there. Now you talked about the restoration of tax brackets. You know, it's not just restoring tax brackets, but there's so many other provisions and work that needs to be done that could uh, increase revenues. Now the the um, where the kind of rub is is that. I would argue that on the House side, we really want to make sure that we expand some of those taxes and restore some of those taxes as well on corporations and the very, very, very rich. Um, now, the Senate side is trying to say, mm, maybe we don't need all of that. And the thing is, is that we do need that. We just do. And we need it not just to pay for things, but we need it actually to um, we need it to stem income inequality in this country, and that is actually one of the strongest cases for taxing the very 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 rich at high um, marginal tax rates. And this is what we did in the 1950s and the 1960s. And at that point, that was that. You know, our tax code matched with the fact that we had really strong unions and a strong labor movement really made sure that income inequality was kept pretty um, in check. But when we started removing some of these provisions, we started seeing these runaway, um, this runaway gap between the very wealthy and, um, and everyday people. And everyday people have gone from being, you know, middle class to working class to working poor. Um, and it's been harder and harder and harder to be able to build a prosperous life because of the pressure of income inequality, because we're all making more money collectively, but all of that money is going at the very top. And so making sure that we're restoring our tax code is an important part of that, but it is currently part of the fight right now because we have a whole lot of lobbyists that have descended here <laughs> in DC um, who are trying to say, hey, you don't really need to do that. And we do really need to do that. And so um, a lot of political engagement is going to be very necessary. Uh, I am, you know, I am honored to be your Congresswoman. I can tell you that I'm very much pushing uh, to tax the rich and corporations, but we need to make sure that um, that state and, you know, that our senators across the country and that uh, members of Congress across the country have communicated that and that you've communicated to that, that to them as well, because um, this is, you know, this is a really, really, really important piece of all of this. And it not just makes the solvency of these programs, not just enhances the solvency of, of uh, some of these structural investments, because you don't need to tax to, for certain expenditures like infrastructure, uh, like physical infrastructure, but it's really important, uh, even if it doesn't pay for anything, which it certainly does help contribute to everything, of course. But um, even if it doesn't pay for everything, it helps us check income inequality as well. So there are two really important purposes. It's the pay fors, but it's also income inequality. So there's two really important uh, uh, purposes to making sure that we step up taxes on the very wealthy. Thank you, Congresswoman. And the next question will be for Susan. Um, when is the IRS refunding people for paying tax on the first 10,200 of unemployment? Some people filed taxes before the American Rescue Plan was in place. That's a good question. Uh, for those that filed before the American Rescue Plan was initiated, then you probably did include all of your unemployment on your tax return as you're required to. And so in May, the IRS started making adjustments to tax returns, but we started with the simplest tax return. So single individual, no dependents, only had maybe their wages and unemployment on their tax return. And most of those folks have already received their refunds. Actually, just yesterday, the IRS issued about 4 million more refunds based on those unemployment adjustments. So you might want to check your bank account and see if you were in the next batch that went out. But we'll continue throughout the year until we get to the most complex tax returns, which are going to be the folks that filed married, filing jointly, had several different types of income, 
and maybe several different deductions because everything on that tax return may need to be adjusted based on the unemployment exclusion. But great question, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, the next question is for the Congresswoman. This is from Makunda from Woodside. Since canceling all student loan doesn't seem to have full support, has the House considered a bill to eliminate interest on student loans? So I think this is a wonderful question. Um, now, full student loan cancellation in canceling all of, um, you know, anyone's amount, no matter what the, you know, no matter what that amount is, does have resistance. However, uh, where we have developed a lot of momentum is in cancellation of uh, at least $50,000 of student loan debt. And in fact, going back to the Civilian Climate Corps, um, we've actually, you know, our Civilian Climate Corps proposal not only doubles the wage that AmeriCorps workers uh, will receive, because right now AmeriCorps workers, it is ridiculous. But if you're in AmeriCorps, you're making about seven bucks an hour, making federal minimum wage. Um, and, but what our, our new proposal does is that it increases that to a $15 minimum wage and allows for, and includes medical and, and healthcare benefits and includes student health, uh, student loan, uh, enrollment of student loan, eligibility for student loan, uh, cancellation. And so that's an aside. Um, so one of the things that the reason I'm saying that is because we should not give up the fight on student loan cancellation. Don't say, oh, no, it hasn't happened now. It's not going to happen. So let's just focus on the interest rate. Yes, we absolutely want to bring down that interest rate. Senator Warren uh, has, has discussed this. I've joined her um, on several of these efforts. But don't settle for less. Um, we are still pushing on student loan cancellation. It's extraordinarily important and it is possible. One of the reasons why I think it hasn't happened immediately is that first of all, Biden came in, you know, I would be generous and say being suspect <laughs> of it. He wasn't fully on board, but we didn't allow that to stop us. So we started chip, chip, chipping away. We got Senator Schumer on board. We have Senator Warren that's championing this cause. Um, and what's happening now is that we, we are starting to chip away. And what we're starting to see now is that there are some folks in the Biden administration that are starting to soften a little bit on this. And so while President Biden may not go full student loan cancellation, regardless of uh, the, the amount, one of the things that he has decided to do is that he recently ordered the Department of Education to, um, to essentially provide a, a a report. He has asked for a report or essentially a summary from the Department of Education on his executive authority to cancel student loan debt in general. So right now, the Department of Education is working on this, and that is the current state of affairs. Now, what the Department of Education comes out with, which we believe we believe, you know, we have confidence and we know that that um, President Biden or any president, it is it is within the executive's power. There is a, there is executive authority for the president alone to cancel student loan debt. He can do it through executive order. Now, when Biden ordered the DOE to provide him this report, if the DOE then comes back and says that, which we believe from all indications that they certainly should, um, depending on the contents of that report, that could open the window where essentially the Department of, if the Department of Education themselves give him the legal green light to do it, then I think that we have a really incredible window of opportunity for him to do so. And so I wanted to provide that update there because I don't want you to think that the dream is dead and that this was just something, you know, but you do raise an excellent point in that bringing down uh, the number on student loan debt cancellation, uh, on student loan debt uh, interest, interest on student loans is something that we absolutely um, 
have been advocating for and will continue to work on. And then just as a third point, sorry, sorry, Alejandra, as a third point, I know that um, all of our student loans are, if you have hold federal student loans, repayment is suspended right now. And it is suspended until this fall. Um, now, one of the things that we've been increasing pressure on is to move that deadline so that student loan payments can continue to be suspended until next March. And so we're trying to push it to give people at least one or two more seasons of relief um, so that we can so that people can continue to try to put their lives together after the pandemic um, and have that suspension in student loan. So uh, just that's just kind of an overall student loan update for you all. Thank you for the update. Um, the last question will be for Susan. Arbine asks, are there certain income requirements to receive the child tax credit? Another good question, if I can come off mute. Okay. You are off mute. Okay, thank you. I've, my computer is ancient. I apologize. Um, there is no income requirement, so you can have zero dollars of income and qualify for the credit. There is a top phase out amount. So if you're single and your income or married, filed and separate and your income goes above 75,000, then you could um, be subject to a phase out if you're head of household and your income goes above 112,500, you could be subject to a phase out. And if your income is, uh, you're married, filed and joint and your income is over 150,000, you could be subject to a phase out but it will not be eliminated to zero unless your income is um, if married filing jointly over 400,000 or if you're any other filing status over 200,000. So there's a, there's a window between those first numbers and those last numbers that it would be reduced, but not phased out completely until you were over the 200 or $400,000 mark. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, now we're going to move on to the press gaggle. Um, if you are a reporter and would like to ask a question, please click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen and share your name and outlet on the question field. Um, reporters who will be selected will be unmuted, so be ready to ask your question to the member directly. And while we wait, I'd like to put in a plug for our internships. Uh, we are hiring interns for the fall and the application deadline will be Monday, July 18th. So please, it is a paid internship um, in our congressional office. Alrighty, so now we'll have Annie Grayer from CNN. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, Congressman, thanks so much for taking the time to do this. Um, we talk, you talked a lot about uh, infrastructure and reconciliation tonight. I wanted to ask you, you know, ahead of Senate Democrats announcing their uh, 3.5 trillion proposal, progressives in the House specifically were calling for a 6 trillion uh, price tag. I'm wondering if you can characterize, you know, how you feel about the budget resolution that was announced earlier this week, given that it's less than uh, what progressives wanted and just kind of how you're framing, you know, what you see in the budget uh, budget resolution is, do you view that, do you view it potentially as, as a loss for, for progressives? Well, so I think there's a couple of things about breaking down these numbers, right? Because we hear 6 trillion here, 3.5 trillion there, and what do these numbers mean, et cetera. Um, and one of the things that I don't think is kind of given enough attention is the fact that uh, a lot of these figures, particularly the lower figures like the 3.5, it, it is not, uh, they're not always reflective of the full spend of the bill because they include the offsets or the pay force. And so it's a 3.5 trillion outlay investment um, but 
a lot of times the overall investment, the amount that we're actually putting out there and investing in infrastructure is much higher than 3.5 trillion. And then you bring it back by the pay force, which get you to you know, about 3.5 trillion. And so all that being said, we did, you know, we did want even more, of course. Uh, we want that that outlay, we would like that outlay to be six trillion so that we're spending, uh, you know, Id ideally 10, you know, having that 10 trillion and then having potentially those outlays that bring us back to a 6 trillion point. Um, 10 trillion is also the number that we wanted to get for a Green New Deal. Now, the fact that we're at 3.5 trillion, though, though, doesn't mean that that's the entirety of investment. And so um, because there are some of those offsets and outlays there. And so I think that this is an enormous victory, first of all. This bill is absolutely a progressive victory because if it wasn't for progressives in the House, we probably would be stuck with that tiny, pathetic, bipartisan bill alone. And that would have been the entirety of our infrastructure spending. And so um, compared, to the, compared to the bipartisan package, which is what 1.6, Seven, I believe, um, it, compared to the to the very small number of the bipartisan infrastructure package, uh, what House progressives have been able to do is a have a much larger bill. The reconciliation bill is larger than the bipartisan bill, um, and it contains progressive priority priorities. It is led and spearheaded by pr progressive priorities. And frankly, it's much larger than I believe even uh, the Biden administration would have come into alone without, um, without the progressive momentum built for big infrastructure spending. And so um, is it the Green New Deal in its entirety with a $10 trillion, uh, with a $10 trillion investment? Four trillion in outlays and uh, rather four trillion in revenue raisers, taxing the rich, corporations, et cetera, and uh, six trillion. Okay, no, but cut me some slack. I'm just after my first term. <laughs> but I do think that um, I think this is absolutely a progressive victory. We've got universal. Uh, we have universal child care. We have the first establishment of the Civilian Climate Corps, in, which is the first time in almost 100 years, um, or perhaps like 80 years or so, since 1938, the first uh, revitalization of the Conservation Corps with an expansion of its mandate. So this is not just about building trails in our national parks. This is about weatherizing people's homes. Uh, for climate disaster. This is about putting solar panels on people's roofs. This is about beautifying uh, neighborhoods and, and really working with communities like ours with high childhood asthma rates. Um, and this is about ex essentially creating a universal basic income program for children. And so um, I think we've won. <laughs> None of that would have happened without the Progressive Caucus, I think. You know, I, I mean, I think that if it wasn't for House progressives, even if we still had 3.5 trillion in spending, it would, a lot of it would be in, um, frankly, carbon producing investments like roads and bridges alone. I don't think we would have the care infrastructure in this, uh, in, in this bill. And I think we would have gotten a lot more car infrastructure um, and much less public transit uh, investment on the level that we need. And so I, you know, this is 3.5 trillion in progressive spending. That's what I think is really important too. It's 3.5, it's a 3.5 trillion package around progressive priorities. So it's not just the price tag, it's what we're spending on. And progressives, I would say, uh, if I can, you know, not be humble for a moment. I think we've run the board in determining the priorities of, of our spending. Awesome. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, that is all we have for today. Uh, thank you all so much and for our constituents for joining us tonight. Your engagement is really what keeps us and allows us to continue your fight, fight for you in Congress. Um, I also wanna thank our transcribers, Cara Camacho and Wendy Buher. Uh, thank you to our interpreter, 
interpreters, Aldo Resendiz, Anais Velasquez, Edward Lau, Rebecca Chohari, Yakub Ali, and Megat Lama. Um, and again, you can always, always contact us at our office by calling 718-662-5970. Have a Thank good you, night. everyone. Thanks for joining us.